want you to take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We have just started a series here looking at social issues, cultural issues, through a biblical worldview. Kind of taking a break from book studies and going through more of a topical study here. We're faced with cultural issues. It was exceedingly present in the presidential debate last night, wasn't it? Uh, on one side, you have pro-life who believes that the life inside the womb is human life and to terminate that life is murder. Uh, without giving, you know, the child has no choice. Uh, the mother's comfort trumps the child's life, you know, murder it so I can be comfortable. Versus the other side of the aisle, which says, no, it's all about the mother's rights, woman's re reproductive rights. And they've packaged it in such a nice little wrapping, uh, woman's reproductive rights. How dare you tell me what to do with my body? And, and, you know, it sounds good and it sounds right, but it completely ignores a very vital truth that that is not your body and it is not your life that is inside the womb. And when you acknowledge, yes, that is human life, and to terminate it is for it to be dead, and therefore if you are forcibly doing it, then it is murder in God's eyes. To get them to that point to admit that, they'll never do. They'll never do. Uh, you'll, not find, you'll not find a liberal who's willing to come to the point where they're ready to admit that. Uh, and if they do, it's a very rare, honest person that you'll find. And uh, you know, anyways, I move on from that. But we're, how do we deal with these cultural issues from the Bible rather than just saying, well, I wasn't taught that way or I'm from the Bible belt or uh, mama and dad didn't teach me that or my preacher said this. No, how about what the Bible has to say concerning these cultural issues? And so we began here uh, last Wednesday evening looking at the very foundational place. And we are looking at the cornerstone of life last week. The cornerstone of life. Let's see if he'll cooperate with me tonight. The cornerstone of life. We said, number one, and this is what we originally looked at, was the reliability of that cornerstone. But what was the, the significance of the cornerstone here? We said, you know, the cornerstone was a large, expensive block that they would put in a building and they would put that first and they would set that stone so that it was facing exactly the direction it was supposed to be facing so that the corner of the building was exactly where it was supposed to go and then the rest of the building could be built off of that stone. That stone would give direction to the rest of the building. That stone would give elevation to the rest of that building. That stone is what caused the rest of the building to be what it was supposed to be. If the cornerstone was not placed correctly, then everything else was going to be off. Of course, we take this thought and we compare it to our spiritual lives, which is the point, because Jesus is the cornerstone. And when we take Jesus Christ as our cornerstone and we place Him first, I don't just necessarily mean first as in priority, while that is true, we place Him before everything else. That's what you know, first means. Here's Christ. Now, I'm going to try to fit in everything else. But you know what often happens? We try to squeeze in all of the little things, and a lot of the big things get left out. I remember watching a preacher give an illustration, and he had a jar up there on the pulpit, and he had golf balls, marbles, BBs, sand, and water, all in separate containers. And he says, there's only one way for me to get all of these items into my jar. He says, if I start by filling my jar with sand, I'm not going to be able to get everything else in there. If I start by filling my jar with water, I'm not going to be able to get everything else in there. He says, the only way it's going to work is if I start with the big things. And so I start and I put the golf balls in there. And then I put the marbles in there. And then I put the BBs in there. And then I put sand in there. And then I put water in there. And guess what? There's space for everything if I do it in the right priority. If we have Jesus first, in other words, we start with Him, and then we make our marriage align with the truth of the Word of God. If we take our family and our children and we start there with Him, and then we make everything else align to that. Education, sports, 
dress, entertainment, all of those things, because all of those things are real day-to-day dirty things that we've just got to get into. Well, how do we figure that out? Well, we start with the Word of God. We start with Jesus Christ. We start with what's right. And then that gives us clear direction to be able to put everything else in its appropriate place. We also looked at a, a chart here looking at you know, God's view versus uh, the secular view. You know, when we look at things from a biblical worldview, in other words, the lens by which I view the world around me is uh, through the Word of God, through God's eyes Himself, God's purpose, then I'm going to see well, that I'm supposed to glorify God, I'm supposed to be holy, that there are absolute truths, that emotion is a byproduct, it's not supposed to lead me, I'm supposed to follow truth and let the emotions catch up. My emotions may want to pull me this way or that way or cause me to want to do wrong may cause me to want to compromise. Instead, I say, no, this is the truth, this is the truth. Even if it, you know, even if I don't want to do it, even if it even hurts to do it, this is what's right to do, this is the truth, and then let my emotions catch up. Of course, we also believe in personal sin. We also believe that uh, we need forgiveness. Let's see, ooh, I have a laser pointer. Yes, I forgot about that. Uh, we also believe in personal sin, that we need forgiveness from that personal sin, and that we must repent. A secular worldview is the opposite of all of those things. And I'm not going to go through this chart once again. If you're super interested in the chart, you can go back to last Wednesday evening's uh, sermon and listen to it or watch it. I don't remember. I've been having issues with a live stream lately, and it's, it's mostly my fault. Uh, I've just been forgetting to do one thing or another. And anyways, I, I hopefully I have it all set tonight. Then we took also... Uh, a moment to look at this chart at the decline of religion. And you can see uh, in these various countries, the United States being the one at the very bottom, the most dramatic shift away from religion has taken place in the United States. And so now uh, a vast majority of uh, young adults, 30 and under, do not identify as any kind of religion. Uh, they try to avoid it altogether. And to, to a certain extent, I, can't, I can say I, I don't blame them because, you know, there's just so much fake and false religion out there that it, it's cringy and you want to run away from it. And if that was your first experience with quote-unquote religion, with some of these TV preachers, uh, some of these works, you know, salvation by works places, then yeah, I can understand why you wouldn't want anything to do with that and think that we're all the same. But that's not the truth. But nevertheless, it is in great decline. We looked at Robert Moeller's quote here. Um, the decline of the Christian identity is particularly pronounced among younger Americans, and fully one-third of those aged 35 and younger report no religious affiliation. Uh, move along here. Uh, number, point number one was the reliability of the cornerstone, and we already looked at that on your outline there. Number one, the reliability of the cornerstone. What is it reliable for? Letter A, it's reliable for identity. It's reliable for identity, and we looked at that last week. It defines who we are, and we can draw our identity from Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. But it's also reliable for, keep going here, it's also reliable for unity. With Jesus as the cornerstone of the church, Christians are the stones that build. And we looked at verses like Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And we also said, letter C, it is reliable for direction, gives us an appropriate direction, just like uh, the cornerstone is that foundational stone. And so if I want to run my wall, if I set the block here, and I want to run this wall, it's going to have to go based off of this stone. This stone's face is here, so the rest of the faces of the stones are going to have to be here. And it gives me direction. And so long as I'm basing everything else off of this stone, it's going to be true. It's going to be stable. It's going to be exactly as it is intended to be. And so that cornerstone is reliable for direction. Which brings us now to point number two. The revelation of the cornerstone. The revelation of the cornerstone. I've entitled, um, I guess, this evening sermon, um, 
uh, how Jesus was revealed and rejected and why that matters. How Jesus was revealed and rejected and why that matters. You're, you turn your Bible to Ephesians 2. Let's look over there. Ephesians 2. And let's see. I want to begin reading in verse... Let me find the right one here. Verse number 19. Ephesians 2, verse number 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, verse 20 is important here. Built upon the foundation. Notice what the foundation is. The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Okay, so our text here it reveals very specifics about Jesus as our cornerstone. Letter A, for the identity of our foundation. For the identity of the foundation. Now, everybody is aware, you, before you build a structure, you must first build a foundation. Foundations can take on different forms. Uh, depending on what kind of structure you're building, your foundation can be a bed of gravel uh, that has been compacted and leveled, and there is the foundation which you lay. Sometimes on top of that bed of gravel, you're also going to lay a cement footer. And you're going to uh, have a foundation. It may be as wide as the building itself, or you may just have small footers that pylons will be driven down into. If you were building down on, say, Santa Rosa Island in Pensacola, Florida, in that area, uh, you drive down uh, the road out there on Santa Rosa Island, and you'll see a lot of houses that are up off the ground by at least 20 feet or 15 feet, and they're up on stilts. Most of the houses are on stilts. Well, the answer as to why that is will be obvious because, well, when the hurricanes come through, they can have 20, even 30 foot swells of water come through and wash over those islands. And so if you want to have your multi-million dollar house kept safe, you stick it way up off of the ground and you park your Tesla underneath of it. Uh, let it get washed away, I guess. But uh, you keep it up off the ground so that it's still there when you come back after the hurricane. Well, they, what do they do with those large pylons that they built the house on? Usually uh, they're uh, made out of wood, but they'll take those and they'll drive them deep, deep, deep down into the sand. So deep that nothing is going to move those pylons. That is the foundation for which it is built. However, if the foundation is crooked, well, there's a problem. We looked at a house when we were uh, looking to buy a house here in the area. We looked at a house in uh, Churchville. And it had a big old three-car garage that was like twice the size of the house itself. Uh, and there were several problems the, with the three-car garage. The uh, cement floor had some cracks in it big enough to swallow a Volkswagen. I mean, it had some big old cracks in the floor. And you looked at the back wall of the garage, and it was bowing out. The, it was a brick wall on the back. The brick was bowing out like this. There were some serious issues with the foundation of that garage. Don't know what, maybe it had settled more than they had anticipated. Maybe they didn't, uh, you know, wait for the dirt to settle enough or something. Uh, but there were some serious issues with the foundation of that garage. Uh, it was something that would certainly have to be dealt with, but not by me. <laughs> I wasn't going to be the one to pay to have that one looked at or dealt with. If the foundation is crooked, then you cannot help but everything else being on top of it being crooked as well. A building without a strong foundation eventually will fall. Your life, your marriage, without a strong foundation, it will fail. It will eventually fail. A home without a strong and sure foundation, it will eventually fail. Even a church, a church without a strong foundation, you say, well, I mean, if it's a church, wouldn't it have God as the foundation? Not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. If they are not 
preaching and teaching the truth, adhering to it, the truth, if they are not preaching the gospel, if they are not going outside those walls and seeing people get saved, if they are not making corrections to sin inside people's lives in the church that need, it needs to be corrected, if they're just ignoring it, whitewashing it, ignoring their duty as a Christian, they're hiding their light basically as a church, then they're not building their church upon the foundation of the Word of God. And their foundation is cracked and it is crooked and it shouldn't be any wonder that the church will fail, even if the crowds increase. I remember somebody said one time, just because something is growing does not mean that it's alive. You ever see deer on the side of the road after they've been hit by a car? Give them a good 24, 36 hours. They start growing, don't they? Their, their abdomens start growing, swelling, actually. And then eventually they go, you know, and all the nastiness inside is now on the outside. And somebody's got to drag it away and smell the awfulness of it. And, of course, you do as well. My two f- least favorite seasons in the Shenandoah Valley are um, spring when they start spreading manure all over these fields. And the whole valley stinks. And uh, skunk mating season when the skunks are out trying to cross the road all at the same time and they're all dying. <laughs> and then you've got to drive past five dead skunks on your way home. Those are my two least favorite seasons here in the valley. But just because something's growing doesn't necessarily mean that it is alive. A church has to have that solid foundation of the Word of God. And I don't want that to just be a trite statement that everybody just says, Amen, and we move on. No, it, I, I mean, legitimately, we need to take the Word of God and we need to take it apart and we need to study it. And we need to learn from it. And then we need to take it and literally build our lives upon it. Say, here are the truths upon which I build myself as an individual. My honesty, my character, my uprightness, my morality, my, you know, my uh, standards and, and positions, principles. These are the things upon which I will build myself. Then we can extend that to other relationships. We can extend that even to dating and to marriage, to families. We can extend that beyond. But it always starts with the individual. When Christ built the New Testament church, He chose to use the apostles and prophets as the foundation. Look what it says there in verse number 20. Verse number 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, what does he mean here when he says the apostles and the prophets? Does he mean he literally laid them down and built a church upon them, you know, their dead bodies? No, that's not what he means in a literal sense. We think about it. The prophets, who does that entail? Well, the Old Testament prophets. So we have from Moses all the way up through the, the late major and minor prophets. Well, hey, that's the Old Testament. And then what about the apostles? The apostles, man, well, we've got the 12 disciples minus Judas, uh, plus Paul, Colossians, I think, 1.1 1, 1, uh, adds, or maybe it's Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Um, I don't want to say it wrong here, make sure I say it right. Yeah, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul includes himself in that number of the apostles. So if we include Paul and the other disciples, well, what do we get from them? Well, we get the New Testament from them. They are the writers of the New Testament. Okay, so we have the prophets. Those are the writers of the entire Old Testament. And we have the apostles. Those are the writers of the New Testament. So then what is the foundation he's referring to here? Was it the individual people? Or was it the doctrine that they were teaching? It was the doctrine that they were teaching. Now, we're going to get to the cornerstone here in just a little bit. He says here that the apostles... And the prophets, this was the foundation. And so, as a church, this is our foundation. If you don't like using the Word of God and its objective morality, hey, there's a universalist church around here somewhere. And you can go and do whatever you want there and be whoever you want to be, and they'll celebrate you for it all the way into hell. But if you want to have an actual foundational objective morality that does not change with time, and it does not change with culture, and it does not change with laws, and it does not change with whatever the university professors are teaching, it always consistently stays the same. That is the Word of God. That's the kind of foundation that I need. 
and want to build my life upon. So he says here in chapter 2, verse 20, that the church is built upon the apostles and the prophets. Those are the ones who were used by God to reveal doctrine. He spoke through them. He inspired them to give us the Scriptures. So really, the Word of God is the foundation. It says in Acts 2, 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. I think, I think we got all of the major uh, food groups here covered, right? We got the apostles' doctrine. We got preaching. Uh, breaking of bread, whether or not that's referring to the Lord's Supper or just meeting and fellowshipping together. Hey, we got both of those bases covered. I'm all about the meeting and fellowshipping together over some Cuban food. Uh, and in prayers, meeting together once a week as we do and sharing prayer requests and praying together, men meeting together once a, once a month and being able to share prayer requests together and pray together. Ladies, you interested in having a, a prayer, a ladies prayer meeting? Um, you know, talk to my wife, work it out. Uh, that'd be good. Listen to this quote. It's by Albert Barnes. He says, The doctrines which they taught are the basis on which the church rests. Foundation. The doctrines of the Word of God are the foundation. Because God knew. He knew me and He knew you. And we have a tendency to drift, don't we? Without any clear direction, we have a tendency to drift. All you've got to do is turn the engine off on a boat and you'll immediately start drifting, unless you are actively pushing it in a direction, unless there is actual energy being used into, you know, pushing it into a direction or keeping it straight, the natural tendency is for it to drift. And so God gave us doctrine. He gave us the Word of God to be able to have that doctrine. Letter B, the identity of the cornerstone. The identity of the cornerstone. We looked at the identity of the foundation. He calls it the apostles and the prophets. This is really the Word of God. Then we look at the identity of the cornerstone, which won't come as any surprise to anybody. We already saw that Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He is the cornerstone, period. But what was amazing for first century believers, first century, this is during the time of Christ, was that Jesus' role as cornerstone had been foretold by the prophets. So Jesus gets up and he begins to speak to the Jews about himself being that cornerstone. That was not new information to them. They had already been hearing this in the synagogue on Sabbath days, being taught about the future Messiah being the cornerstone. And so when Jesus got up and began speaking about it, they immediately knew what he was talking about. Back in Isaiah 28, verse 16, it says this, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's It's a hill in Jerusalem. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In Psalm 118, verse 21, it says this, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of of the corner. Remember how I've said before, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah to come that everybody had been looking for would actually end up being rejected by Israel. I wonder to myself how modern day Orthodox Jews get around that fact all throughout the Old Testament, that it was obvious throughout the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to be rejected. And here is another verse alluding to that fact in Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the builders refused. They looked at it, they said, nope, this is not the one I want. I go out and I buy lumber, you know, every week or so, and when I go and buy lumber, I pull the board out and I look at it long ways. I want to see if it's doing this number or if it's twisting. I want to see if it's cupped. You know, I look at it long ways to see if it's cupped in the middle. Uh, I take a look at those boards. I want to see if there's any big old knots that right now they're fine, but, you know, in six months they may rot and fall out of there and then leave a big hole in that board. And I look for all of those things in that board, and a lot of it gets rejected. I get there, and I I can see the rejection pile from the people who came before me. They didn't want those, so I probably don't want those either. So I'm going to skip past those and start looking at the ones they haven't gone through yet. But the stone that the builders refused 
has ended up becoming the head of the corner. Now Jesus, in Matthew 21, He's the virgin-born, eternal Son of God. He was ordained by God to be that cornerstone. Jesus says, with a, in a conversation with the Pharisees in Matthew 21 and 42, listen to this. Jesus verifies that He is the cornerstone. He said, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This is a quote from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Have you ever heard that? Listen to what He says next. This is the Lord's doing, and it, is mar and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, just in case there's any confusion as to what Jesus is referring to there, Matthew 21, 42, what do the Jews do next? They immediately are incited to kill Jesus. They, they were angered. The Pharisees were angered. They were now seeking his head. Why would the Pharisees get so angry at that statement? Because they knew what he was claiming. He was claiming to be the Messiah. He was claiming to be the Son of God. Jesus claimed it often. Some people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, he certainly did a lot. And here's one of those examples. But although the Pharisees rejected Christ... Those of us who choose to believe on Jesus Christ as our Savior, He is precious. He is a sure foundation or cornerstone for our lives. It's quite possible that maybe a long time ago you had gotten saved. You became a Christian. The Word of God and, and Jesus Christ was very important to you. And you went to church and you just got a lot out of it. And it was really important to you. But as time went by, you got on with your life. Things happened. Good things happened. Bad things happened. There was, you know, emotional highs and lows. Uh, and as time went by, you begin to care less and less about the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe big life changes came around and you kind of reoriented your life. You kind of pushed out the door some things that, that you didn't find much value in, and, and maybe church attendance was one of them. Maybe the reading of, of God's Word, prayer, soul winning. Uh, maybe those things were some things that you just kind of pushed off aside because you did not see much value in them. That doesn't mean there wasn't any value in them. You just weren't seeing it because your eyes were, well, looking elsewhere at other things. But this is not where he's supposed to be. We have to actively make that choice to place Him down as our cornerstone. I'm not saying you need to take your marriage and your family and your own personal life and just knock all the blocks down and start over again. But we do maybe need to do some realigning. Like I said, you turn the engine off on a boat and it immediately starts, dr starts drifting. And when we are not purposefully driving ourselves to do what's right, we will start drifting. Maybe tonight is a good night for some realignment, some realignment of priorities. Starting personally, that's the best place to start. I know we all have maybe desires in some relationships that we have and, and how we would like to increase things. We start personally as an individual. How can I increase in my relationship with God? How can I be doing what's right? How can I you know, better align myself to Jesus Christ, this cornerstone? Am I heading in the right direction? Is He giving me the right identity? Is He giving me uh, the right guidance? And if, it's, if not, it's not His fault. It's me that's not listening. It's me that's not aligning myself to Him. Then we get to number three, main point number three here. The rejection of the cornerstone. The rejection of the cornerstone. The world hates Christianity. The world especially hates Jesus Christ. Jesus said they did, and He said they would, and He said that it would not get any better. And it's very obvious to see as, as time goes by, that our position on the Word of God has become an embattled one. 
to the point where often we feel like we need to just keep our mouths shut about some things because we're afraid of what people might think if we, you know, speak truth. If we open up about our true feelings concerning some things, we're afraid that we may lose some friends or, you know, alienate, be alienated from some family. I understand we need, to, we need to weigh carefully our words and make sure that we are speaking the truth in love. We don't, we don't want to go out there with a the desire of driving a wedge between ourselves and somebody else. But it's obvious that the world around us is getting hostile to Christianity. Why? Really, it's because the Christian faith allows for no other way to God except through Jesus Christ alone. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way to heaven. It, it, it's not about church attendance. It's not about being born in a Christian family. It's not about baptism. It, you know these things. I'm not telling you anything new tonight. There is only one way to heaven. And some may say, well, how narrow? You think your way is the only right way. How narrow-minded of you to think that only you are right. But it's not me. I, these are not my ideas. I did not sit up last night making this stuff up, and now I'm trying to force everybody else to agree with me. That's what the secularists do. They stay up and make up gender terms, and they make up all sorts of weird you know, definitions and terms, and then they get out there on TikTok and they say, you must agree with me or you're a bigot, or it's hate speech. No, that's not what I did. I simply took the words that had been written thousands and thousands of years ago, and that have been preserved, and that have been proven powerful all of these millennia, and I'm standing upon them just like my forefathers did and theirs before them. I'm standing on them just like the church has always done. It may hurt to see Jesus rejected, but it's not anything new. Letter A, rejection in history. This is nothing new. He was rejected throughout all of history. We go all the way back to the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, there was nothing but sin all across the world at the time. I mean, God could not find righteous people with the exception of Noah and his family. Can you imagine? I mean, we think the world's bad right now. I mean, it is. But yet we can find more than that right here in this room. And tonight there's many other independent Baptist churches out there meeting. Or maybe Tuesday night or whenever they have the midweek service or on Sunday. You know, it's not like it was in the days of Noah. It's not quite that bad yet. I also think of the Israelites throughout the centuries. Imagine the Israelites, they saw manna fall from heaven. They had food, and I'm pretty sure manna was Krispy Kreme donuts. Uh, they, had, they woke up every morning to Krispy Kreme donuts out on the desert floor. I hope they were in boxes because nobody wants sandy Krispy Kreme donuts, right? Uh, and uh, they woke up every morning to that. How amazing! I mean, they saw the ten plagues against Egypt. How miraculous. They saw the Red Sea part, massive, who knows, four, five, six-story tall walls of water. And they walked across on dry ground. Maybe even picked up a few stranded fishies along the way. They saw the walls crash in on the Egyptian army that was following them. They saw the fiery serpents, but then they also saw the brazen serpent and the healing that came when they looked upon it. They saw that their shoes did not wear out, and that their clothes did not wear out for 40 whole years. I mean, I have four kids, and I can tell you one thing. A single pair of socks does not last very long. It doesn't take long before there's holes in those socks. A single pair of shoes does not, li does not last long on a little boy, I can tell you that much. Uh, or even a single pair of jeans, it's going to have holes in its knees and stains all over it very quickly. But imagine for 40 years... Their, the soles of their shoes did not wear out. Their clothes did not wear out. God was miraculously providing for them. Not only that, He was miraculously leading them. Imagine following a pillar of fire at nighttime. Man, how intimidating that would be to see this massive pillar of fire. This is the presence of God and you're following it in a pillar of smoke during the daytime. Imagine seeing that. 
Imagine crossing over the Jordan River when God parts it. Imagine seeing the walls of Jericho miraculously fall inward. No battering rams, no siege engines. The walls just fell in on themselves, with the exception of Rahab's little section of wall. And I can go on about all the things that the Israelites had seen God do, and you and I have not seen any of those things. I've not seen waters parted. I've not seen the massive plagues that defy human imagination or explanation pop up. I've not seen any of those things. And yet, having been through all of that, they still rejected God. Because they didn't teach their children. And so their children, when they grew up, didn't care about the commands of God didn't care about the sacrificial system, didn't care about living obedient lives before the Lord. You know, to us, if it's a suggestion, to our children, it won't be. To us, if Christianity is a, a, a side note, it's not even going to make it on the page at all in their lives. They have to not just hear from our mouths about what is important, they have to see it in our lives. And even then, the choice is still theirs. It is still theirs to make. Mom and dad can make all the right choices, which is never going to happen, but they could anyways. And their children still may choose their own flesh. They may choose to reject God and walk away from Him. Even during the first century, they saw Jesus in the flesh. And I've, I've said this many, many times now, but it still just amazes me. It, well, it comforts me in one sense, I guess, that you could literally walk and talk with the man, God, Jesus Christ, and still not believe in him. Makes me feel better about witnessing to people and them turning me down. If they could, if they could reject him face to face with him, it's much, more easy to, much easier to just reject me, I guess, as well. Either way, they're rejecting Christ. We even come up to modern day. It's still happening. Peter talks about it. He talks about this rejection before in front of the high priests and other religious leaders. Remember, they had arrested Peter and John in Acts chapter number 4. And the only reason they had arrested them was because Peter and John were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They weren't just preaching good works. They weren't preaching wisdom, you know, wise thoughts. They weren't preaching, hey, let's be a little bit nicer and kinder to everybody and, and hold hands and, you know, let's, let's dance around the fire and let's just make life great and happy and all. No, that's not what Peter and John were preaching. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was the part about Jesus Christ that got them in trouble. Listen to what Peter says in Acts 4.10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man who had been healed stand before you whole. This is the stone, Jesus is the stone that was set at naught by you builders. <laughs> man, there's a, there's a whole lot of finger pointing going on in this statement. Does finger pointing make you uncomfortable? Well, I don't think the religious leaders were enjoying it very much here. Peter was saying, you crucified him. You took the cornerstone. He, quoting from the Old Testament, they would have known what he was talking about. These are religious leaders. They knew what Peter was referring to. And he said, you were the builders. It's you guys. You took the stone, the cornerstone, and set it aside and rejected it. Jesus Christ was that cornerstone. And then he says this, Neither is there salvation in any other. Peter makes an extremely narrow statement. There is no salvation in, found in any other place or any other person but Jesus Christ. He says, For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So he was rejected in history. But he was also rejected in our day as well and is still being rejected today. History repeats itself, right? There was the early 1900s. We saw the rumblings of war. 
And then again in the 1930s and 40s, the rumblings of World War. And we see the same thing again today. The rumblings of World War. Nobody knows where it's going to end up or how it's going to, you know, what's going to happen. We don't know this. History repeats itself. But this is one of those places where we don't want to see history repeat itself. The rejection of Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote. Many people consider it arrogant, narrow-minded, and bigoted for Christians to contend that the only path to God must go through Jesus of Nazareth. In a day of religious pluralism and tolerance, this exclusivity claim is politically incorrect. A verbal slap in the face of other belief systems. To say that our way is the only way is a slap in the face to everybody else. But this is the heart of our modern day culture today. As people reject Christ, what do they have to do instead? They have to erect gods of their own. And so they worship those gods. They worship those falsehoods. They join together to celebrate unity in their falseness as they reject the cornerstone. It says in Deuteronomy 32 31, for their rock is not as our rock even our enemies themselves being judges, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. And every god of this world is going to ultimately fail because they've rejected the true cornerstone. Briefly here, there are two major anti-Christian ideologies I want to talk about and then we'll be done. Two major anti-Christian ideologies, humanism and liberalism. Humanism is is appropriately named. Obviously, we see what is the center of humanism, and that is, well, human. It's man's own self as God. Do you know what the motto of the American Humanist Association is? Good without a God. Good without a God. The American Humanist uh, has produced the Humanist Manifesto too, and it reads this, As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. And this was signed by many academics and the highest levels all across our country, universities, colleges. And it's a bold statement of independence from God. They start with humans, not God, nature, not deity. They've chosen their own cornerstone. They've said, I'm rejecting God, and instead, human intellect, philosophy, and goodness is going to be our cornerstone. The problem with that is, human intellect has always been faulty. I mean, if you think about some of the strangest things we've ever done, like bleeding people out so that we could uh, get out the bad humors from their bodies to help save them and killing them in the process. Um, uh, Having doctors imprisoned and even killed for washing their hands between delivering babies because they were quacks if they washed their hands. Um, I mean, you think about all the really strange things throughout history that we've thought And who knows, if the Lord tarries a hundred years from now or even a thousand years from now, we might look back and think, my goodness, they were dumb back then. (laughs) I can't believe they thought that. I can't believe they did that kind of stuff. I can't believe they didn't know better. And we look back and think, man, I can't believe they didn't know better. You can't rely on human intellect. You cannot rely on human philosophy. You cannot rely upon human physical strength or any kind of strength. Everything man can build can be destroyed. The greatest cities with wonderful, you know, sewage systems and water systems and electrical grids with, uh, you know, subways, elevated trains, bus systems with the best economies. All it's going to take is one missile. And that entire thing is gone, disrupted, useless. There's not a thing that man can build that cannot very easily be destroyed by man. So if I take 
man and his best qualities and make that my cornerstone, I'm starting with sandstone. I'm starting with something that is soft, with something that is malleable, breakable, something that's going to wear down and break down quickly. And then if I go on to build the rest of my structure off of that, I've got some serious trouble coming. And it may not be seen it right away, but it will come. 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. Let me try that again. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Now, I'm not going to have time to finish this tonight, I don't think. We'll come back next Wednesday evening, and we'll look at that other ideology, anti-Christian ideology, liberalism. Of course, you can't help but see it um, in, in the world all around us, you know, but we'll come back and we'll talk some about liberalism, but not just about liberal media or liberal politicians or you know, that liberal churches, you know, when, when that idea of liberality, being open to new ideologies and tolerance makes its way into the churches, then what happens? Well, we, all, we, we already kind of talked about that last week, and I want to finish with this quote, G. Campbell Morgan, the church of God, apart from the person of Jesus Christ, is a useless structure. That's what happens when liberalism makes its way into the church. It becomes a useless structure. So I'll finish with that quote again tonight.